all the way back in 2004, almost two decades ago. Steve Coase is the one that founded the OpenStreetMap project, the OpenStreetMap wiki, starting the concept of mapping parties, creating state-of-the-map conferences, the mailing list, and many other things to do with OpenStreetMap. He's been, the, he's been on the OpenStreetMap Foundation board for many years as a chairperson. He's worked a couple years at TomTom, and now he works at Grab as our head engineering in the geo-innovation uh, department. Big round of applause for Steve Coase. Thank you. I'd forgotten some of those things, so that's funny. I, um, I made a presentation and it had like 60 slides and it was a very Steve presentation where I fly through it and it was all very uh, enthralling and so on. Um, and a couple of things struck me. One was that it just didn't really match the tone of this conference because it was done in isolation before I was here. And uh, it was also full of DALI 2 images and DALI 3 images now as well. And that just seems to be getting like, it's a cliche already. So I was like, shall I really torture these people with yet more machine learning witty images uh, with like people with six fingers and stuff? I'm like, nope, I'll do something else. So this morning, what I did was um, I threw out the slides in the laptop and I took a piece of paper and I wrote down some things. And then various people I was talking to this morning gave me other ideas of things to talk about. Um, and were very useful in coming up with a little list of stuff that I could, I could say. But I don't know how long it's going to take. So if it underruns, we can do some questions. And if it overruns, um, I'll just stop. Uh, so the first thing I want to say is I need a little bit of help from you because um, I've noticed in the last 15 years or something that it's kind of difficult for me to say anything sometimes because it gets misinterpreted or uh, People look for secret reasons for the things I'm saying. So there's no secrets behind here or like some ulterior motive. Um, for a number of reasons, I removed myself off of running the board, uh, running for the board this year. Uh, and there's no motivation. There's no sort, like dark secret. Like this is a good example actually, is that recently I've been saying that the foundation should have a direction and should do things like, uh, to me, the simplest thing is addressing as a, as a great direction, very unifying. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit later. But the point is that um, it was almost immediately I was getting feedback that the reason I thought in addressing was important in OSM and the reason I thought it would be a good direction for OSM to focus on was because of my employer. Um, because my employer does deliveries and deliveries need addressing. Um, and it's sort of hilarious because most of the markets that my employer works in don't have addresses. Like, even if you went and tried to collect them, they don't exist, right? Uh, and it didn't even occur to me that that was my secret motivation for thinking addressing was important because I've been saying that for years. Um, so anyway, I need that help because there's no secrets, right? Or no, I don't know, dark horses or something. And that's just a nice little example. Um, three metaphors occurred to me about how to do this and how to talk about things. If you, so the first one is, I've noticed that my kids, when they draw a picture of a tree, um, like most of us, if you just think of a tree and you think of a picture of a tree, and I ask my kids to go draw it, um, they have the trunk and then they have the leaves and the branches and so on, but they never put the roots in, or very, very rarely, right? And the question is, that, that brings to me is, is that important or not, right? And it's easy to dismiss, right? Because if you just go outside over there and look at a tree, that's what a tree looks like, right? But you're missing a third of the tree, including the thing that holds it up, right? There's a lot of hidden things that are missing, even in daily life that we don't think about at all. Um, and I sort of thought of that when I was looking through the GitHub repo for the OpenStreetMap website, sometimes called the Rails port uh, over the last few weeks. There's an enormous amount of activity going on under there. Um, that is relatively hidden even here that makes the website float. It's sort of like a swan, right? Lots and lots of activity under the water, but over the top, it just sort of works. Um, so that's an example of that. And I think we need to be all enormously grateful to Tom, Grant, and Andy for the amount of work that they do to keep the thing alive. Um, that's my real takeaway of looking, just looking through the comments. It's just the enormous amount of stuff that we don't see, just like that tree in the roots. Um, and then the second is a lot of the language fights you a lot of the time, right? 
So for example, lactose, the thing in milk, is made of glucose and a thing called galactose. And if you just look at that, some of you might even know what that means, but the, the idea is those terms aren't very descriptive. They say what the thing is, but they don't really tell you anything about it. So for example, it sounds very simple that lactose is the milk sugar, it's made of glucose, and it's made of galactose as pairs. But what it doesn't communicate to you is that galactose is actually an isomer of glucose. It means they're the same molecule, just rearranged. Um, and you have to dig in to find that out. If you go read the Wikipedia article or you go uh, talk to ChatGPT about this, it will sort of tell you at a high level. But it doesn't tell you something so fundamental that these two things are mirror images of each other. And it doesn't surface that. It's almost, it's probably the second most important thing about lactose and they don't even talk about it. And it's hidden because of the way this thing developed, because of the way the language developed, right? The most important thing you need to know about lactose is that uh, glucose is used by every cell in your body, but galactose is a poison that's processed by your liver, right? And that's hidden in plain sight, I think. Um, and there was a reason I was gonna tell you that. This is the problem with doing a talk off the cuff. Um, language fighting you. Uh, talking about stuff. Yes. Well, maybe it's addresses and geocoding again, that the detail is not the, the, the goal of doing addresses is not really about geocoding. It's really about a philosophical thing, right? So it's not in the words themselves. It's not the addresses. It's not the geocoding that's important. It's about whether RSM is, is something that will finish or for some definition of finish, because we can instantly argue about whether RSM will ever be finished. And of course it won't because the world keeps changing. Um, I think there was something cleverer that I was going to say, but I've forgotten. Sorry. Um, I think this stuff is important, right? The, the language that we use isn't actually what we think it is, and that most of the things that we have around us are actually hidden, that are, that are right there. Um, and I want to talk about how that relates to OSM as building something new and OSM as something that was existed as a structure. That's what I was gonna say this. You can look at OSM today and it's right there. And it looks sort of like the interstate highway system or the railway network or something. It's, a, it's an artifact that exists, right? Mostly because of all of you, not because of me, right? And there's a, a lot that's sort of fighting you because the decisions that have been made over time and how OSM grew were just made by you know, fragile human beings uh, doing their best at the time. And there's this enormous difference between treating something as new and treating it as something that exists, right? So changing something that exists like RSM, like Steve trying to go and make it do addresses or something is enormously difficult. Um, and when you try to push something like RSM, if you try to push it in a direction, it doesn't have to be RSM, it's just an example. It tends to push back, right? So. And we saw that when I, I was trying to talk to people about uh, RSM having a direction, doing addresses. And there's lots of easy things that we could do to optimize for that. And it pushed back in all kinds of ways, um, personally, professionally, um, technically. How are we gonna do this? Should Steve even be allowed to talk about this? Um, why is Steve wanting to do something again? And uh, as it, as it pushes back, it struck me that OSM is, you know, at 20 now, almost 20, is at university, right? If we're gonna use an age metaphor for a human being in the Western world, they're halfway through their university course or something or nearly finished. And it struck me that I was, it was like me telling my kids that they should study dentistry instead of, I don't know, Chinese poetry or whatever it is that they're interested in, right? And that I should really just stop trying to push this thing. And it's okay to let go and go do something else and work on something new because there's a lot of new things that are out there to do, including, by the way, um, uh, not just around maps, but around all the other open projects that are out there. So for example, one of the things I've been doing recently is spending a lot of time to see whether you could automate something like Wikipedia. And the answer is yes, now with LLMs. And uh, there's an enormous amount of stuff that you can go do with automation that will eventually affect OSM. But OSM is much harder to automate today um, because of the, the way, partly because of the structure of the thing from a technical point of view, but also it's just a much harder thing to automate uh, a large vector network than it would be just a bunch of words on a page. 
Um, and so when you look at that, it can be very it, much easier, and this is me, this is the type of person I am, to just go do something new as to try to keep pushing, right? And it's not really um, anything in, in particular that, that I want to do to, to push. It's more like, how do we reach the goal the fastest? What is the route to get there, right? And that's where it came from with the addressing stuff. So for it, the way I think about it, OSM has, uh, is a display map, so you can look at it. And OSM is a routable map, so you can draw a route over the thing. And when you look at OSM as a display map, it's basically the best in the world, depending on where, where you look, right? Um, it's pretty hard to get better than OSM in terms of you know, vector map for looks. Um, as you can see, all the maps out there. And by the way, one of the coolest maps are the most abstract with the fewest things on them, right? Which is sort of counterintuitive. Um, but for geocoding, so you've got display, routing, and geocoding. Oh, I should talk about routing. So routing, if you have a lot of GPS data, which over my career I've had a lot of GPS data, you can go and test if the routing is any good because you can look at where people drive and you can see if it matches what OSM says they should do, right? So you can, uh, if, you're, if you have all that um, data, you can process it on a large scale and you can say, yeah, the map is pretty good for routing. Like we already know intuitively that the map looks good. That's a display piece. You can prove that it's good for uh, routing. And then for geocoding, um, it's a lot harder. It's much patchier. There's countries that don't even have any geocoding. Um, but it's, it's, it's almost the thing that people start with, right? Because it's the text box on the map that people go and type something into and go uh, to find where they want to go. And so to me, it's just obvious we should go to addressing. Um, but it's, it's also this, it's not just the, the technical piece, there's the community piece, the, the licensing piece, because there are address data sets out there, for example, that we can't just pull in um, because the licenses are incompatible and so on. So there's all these different pieces to the problem, but it's, it's really, it falls out of, should we have a direction or not, right? Um, and an analogy that you could make would be something like uh, Ubuntu versus Debian, right? Debian, is and was a Linux operating system. And it's extremely good at what it does. And it was mostly focused on servers back in the olden days. And then through a variety of things that happened, there's this thing called Ubuntu that came along and extended a lot of the core ideas. Um, Ubuntu extended a lot of the ideas that Debian had and then tried to turn them into something for ordinary people. And that's how we ended up with the Ubuntu desktop. And the desktop was a very hard thing for Ubuntu to do, because for reasons that I don't fully understand, open source is really good at some things and really bad at other things. And so you needed Ubuntu to come and take the best of Debian and then add a little bit so that the operating system would work for people on their laptops, for ordinary people who didn't want to mess around with like Xorg settings to, or X11 as it was then, X11 to, to get the thing working, right? So there was this, uh, positive sum engagement between the two things. And I want to pause there and just tell you a couple of stories very quickly. Um, mm, I did this completely out of order. Sorry, not that you knew that. And I'm going to tell you two quick stories because it struck me that this audience is very different from the audiences that I've talked to or have been at in OSM over the last however many years. That the, the stories haven't been told and they need to be retold sometimes. And the reason I know that is because people ask me. Um, I've been asked a couple of times, including today, why did OpenStreetMap start? And to me, it comes back to this new versus existing artifact thing. Um, to me, my instant reaction is, I think I've told that story a thousand times, right? But it doesn't really matter if you're new to the project because you haven't seen it um, or you haven't watched that talk from 2014 or whatever the last time I did that was. So I'll tell it again. Um, OpenStreetMap started because I needed a map, and it was that simple. Where I was in London, the Ordnance Survey had a monopoly on the map data. Um, it's a government private public partnership uh, that owned all that data, and it meant that me as a student in London, I didn't have uh, access to the data. And I just wanted to draw a map and see where I was. And the reason for that was GPS was this brand new thing back then. GPS allowed you to find where you were, but you could basically just put a dot on a screen. There was no context. There was no map to put it on. And so there were two sort of ways that you could go about this, uh, about getting the map data, maybe three. One, steal it, right? 
uh, which lots of people did. Uh, well, copyright infringed would be the correct term. The other way would be that you could try and convince the government to release this data. And I had some experience with trying to convince the government of things. And you think that the graph is sort of um, random. The amount of effort you put in doesn't correlate very well with the output. So you can try and convince the government of something. I was involved in trying to convince the government that identity cards were probably a bad idea. And you could spend an enormous amount of effort trying to convince the government of this. And then they'll just do it anyway. Or if you knew the right guy, um, you could spend a tiny bit of effort and have enormous effects. But you didn't really control anything, right? So the third way, the third door, was just to go and start mapping, which is what I did. Go and make some tools, go and collect GPS data. And that's the foundation of the project was um, just go do something, right? Uh, as that later happened with all the coding and it impacted the philosophy of the project over time, um, was this bias towards action, as Amazon would call it, um, of just going and doing things. Um, so that was really the, the core. Now, there are other reasons. There are legal reasons RSM started. There are community reasons that it started. There are technical ways that it started. I've only got five minutes. It says 11 minutes. OK, well, I'll try and be quicker. Um, so that's the founding story. There were a lot of other things that we did that were new, like mapping parties that were mentioned. And there's a whole bunch of learnings for those things, too. Um, but most of them are hidden, right? just like the roots of that tree. Not for any particular reason, but because it's hard to go find it, or because the way the project grew, like the, the language grew to describe you know, monosaccharides, it hides what some of these core values were. And unfortunately, part of my role, unfortunately for me, part of my role is to sometimes remind people of these things um, in a way where you don't all hate me um, sometimes. And it feels, it's difficult for me because I don't, I like talking about the future as opposed to the past. I like doing new things. And I don't want to be the grandpa that gets wheeled in, you know, to sort of explain how great the past was. Because um, a lot of times it wasn't. It was hard and it was difficult and it was, uh, complicated and there were strong emotions and lots of people trying to do different things and getting them to collaborate on something like RSM was super difficult. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll end by just talking about that positive versus zero something again, because it's sort of relevant. People keep asking me about Overture and the answer I've been giving um, is that it remains to be seen whether it's positive or zero sum, right? And it could be either. So, and what I mean by that is, um, if you add two things together, are they greater than the sum of their parts, right? So it's, it's possible that it's something like Ubuntu, where Ubuntu took the best of Debian, added and made something new that was greater um, and didn't subtract anything, right? Because a zero something I have to take from you uh, rather than we work together. And there's a bunch of reasons it could be positive sum, a bunch of reasons it could be negative sum, or sorry, zero sum. Right. So a very obvious one to me that you might not be thinking about is the foundation didn't run a conference last year. Right. I think. And that was sort of one of the core things it was supposed to do. And there's a bunch of reasons that we could debate why they were unable to run a conference. But it's a very obvious thing that Overture could do. They could just run this conference next year and they'd probably be better at it in some ways. Right. And worse at it in other ways. And if they did that, the question is, is that positive or negative sum or sorry, zero something? Don't every time I say negative, it's just me slipping. Zero sum, right? If they, if they uh, embrace the conference and they're the driving force, is that a good thing or a bad thing, right? Is it, a, is it helping or is it, or is it zero sum? I don't know. Um, it could be either way, right? When, when they make a new map format to standardize RSM, is that positive or zero sum? I think probably, you know, sort of benign. Um, but through no fault of their own and through no fault, nothing to do with Overture. Most people are zero sum. It's just how we are, right? We're barely evolved out of, you know, Mesopotamia or something, right? We see the money, we want the money, right? We see the orange juice, we want the orange juice, whatever it is. And that's a zero sum thing. Um, and it's just completely natural and easy to be zero sum. It's easy to run the conference, right? It, that would be an easy thing to do. By the way, I have no insight. Let's go back to the secret messages. I have no inside information on whether they want to run the conference or not. No idea whatsoever. It's just not, it's an obvious thing that I would do, right? Um, they may have zero interest in conferences. Um, that's totally fine too. It's just trying to, it's just an example, right? So when you think about this stuff, um, and whether it's going to be good or bad and so on, it really comes down to 
do you do the easy things and do you do uh, the zero sum things or you, do, you try, do you try to go and create something better or something new, right? And I'll end with just one example that someone came brought up the other day is like, it would be uh, easy to make an editor, another editor. It would be easy to run the confluence. It would be really hard to go and make an uh, imagery layer, right? So we need imagery for OSM, things like Mapillary or Carter, Carter View and so on. And there's ways of doing this stuff and decisions that you can make about doing the easy thing that takes away from OSM or doing the, the new positive thing that will create something new. Um, and I hope it's the latter. And I'm sorry for rambling a little bit, but that's my talk. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Any questions? Do you remember why exactly uh, you needed uh, data that you couldn't get from Ordnance Survey and calls OpenStreetMap to exist? Have you finished this uh, project that you originally wanted to do? Well, that's a good question. Um, for me personally, the answer is no, I think, because we don't have all the addresses in the United Kingdom or in London, provably. Um, we can't prove that we have done that. So in a context, in one context, no, my project has failed. The thing that I started has failed. But when you go look at those maps out there, I think one of the maps, forgive me if I get this wrong, but one of the maps was mapping uh, the amounts of uh, pedestrian access areas that have the, the bumps in the road so that uh, people with sight difficulties can navigate around, right? That kind of thing, it's not just OSM. When you have a direction, like we're humans, we have two eyes, we, we have a direction, we don't have eyes on the side of our head like a cow which is trying to be defensive. We're trying to go somewhere, right? The direction that I was going, um, we're not quite there, we probably will get there. But there's all this other stuff, right? Like, um, like these pedestrian navigation things for, for people that are blind or whatever, that are completely out of bounds, that I could never have guessed of, that are enabled by... OSM being a platform, which is, by the way, another key decision that I made, was make the thing open and extensible as opposed to having a top-down ontology where you just told people what to map. Um, so the, the OSM is, is like a beautiful, rare gem artifact because of all that other stuff that I didn't know about, not because I wanted a map of London. So the point is that it's okay that I failed in that sense. Well, I failed is too strong of a term, but I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. All right, Steve, so uh, basically my question is, if you can go back in time, what is it, uh, 19 and a half years back or 20 years back, what you could have been doing differently with OpenStreetMap? Sure. Um, I used to say that the thing I wish I did was have more control, um, especially as I gave up control, because I used to own everything. I owned the, I don't know, the copyright, the website, the things, the servers, and I sort of gave these things away. Um, and... I got sucked into thinking that it would all be better if Steve was still in charge, um, which in some ways is absolutely true, but in a lot of ways is not true at all because you can't, you can't capture the complexity of the world and all the things that people are trying to do um, from you know, Steve's basement, right? And you have, to, you have to let go and let it be free. So I don't have a new answer, but that used to be, do I have a new answer? No, I don't have a new answer. I don't think I'd change anything. It's a little bit like you have to, when you're learning to ride a bike, you have to fall off. It's just you know, we're learning to ski as, as I did a couple of years ago. You just have to fall over and break your face. You know, it's like, <laughs> there, there's, no, there's, there's no way to go back and rerun the simulation. Um, so I'd probably just do it exactly as I did, uh, because you, you know, you have to go there to get here, I guess. Yeah, yeah I think there's one more. <coughs> Yeah, it's more like, um, like a comment. Thank you for the talk, first of all. And then uh, to clear up this mystery, um, just an anecdote from this year. I sent a couple of people who are otherwise very technically capable um, a table in Markdown. And they complained, uh, well, we expected to get a table. And um, then it turned out that expected to get a rendered table. And um, I didn't even realize that they didn't consider the problem to be solved. And I think that's the same thing and over the um, with open source at large and also OpenStreetMap in particular. As a developer, 
and even as a mapper, we will focus on what we consider to be the hard problem. And there's a lot of things we consider to be boring behind that, but we even don't understand this is the problem and that gets ignored. It's not possible otherwise, because it would be too much work to also tackle the boring stuff. But I think that's a simple explanation that it would be out of focus of things where the real consumer expect a lot of more things to be done. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I have any other comment. Yes. Yes, it's it's very difficult. Like um, maybe one quick final story to to that I think riffs on your point is uh, McDonald's in the morning. This is a famous marketing story. McDonald's in the morning sold lots of milkshakes and didn't really understand why because uh, milkshakes were supposed to be something that you had with hamburgers in the afternoon. Oh. And the reason was, I think maybe this is just apocryphal, but they a milkshake in the morning was a, a easy thing that you could have for breakfast that wouldn't fall all over you when you're car right so they thought that they were selling milkshakes right what they were actually selling was um, grease-free breakfast items or something and it's very it's very very easy to be using the wrong metaphors or wrong understanding of what you're doing um, yeah so thank you thank you <laughs> Sorry.